Good work on this. <clears throat> okay, so we're on that one. Right, um, good evening all. It, it was um, suggested that we, we looked at the standard gauge, particularly through to most weight. And then as Stuart put quite a vague sort of description on the advert, um, I've thrown a few more slides in of uh, visitors on the main line across the fence. Um, so we'll, we'll look back. I mean, the, the railway was the connection with the valley almost from the start. Um, roads were pretty grim. So there was quite a lot of work going on in the goods yard. And this is always the best introductory shot. Um, the goods shed, the um, cattle operation on the right there, uh, which persisted for quite a long time. Um, we've jumped forward now <clears throat> to 1928 and we, were, we had standard gauge wagons going in under the tippler and we were producing granite and we were producing ballast, but it was a very, very complex setup. So there's the high level operation with the tippler cage at the far end. These wagons hold ton and a quarter of uh, ballast so you can imagine it takes six or seven or eight um, depending on the sizes uh, to fill a standard gauge wagon um, and filling the standard gauge wagon means that you've got to handball the wagons the full wagons into the tippler so you have then got ton and a quarter ton and a half and although it's on a rolling chassis, it's still um, quite a lot of effort to get it moving. So then you tip one, you move it away, you tip another, and so on till you fill the wagon. And then you've got to go climbing down the stairs um, to get a bar out and bar the wagon that's full out of the way and bring in the next one. Um, empty one to work on. So, am I back? <laughs> oh, lovely. So, the first solution they tried was to buy the six ton bogey hoppers, um, which had a very short life here, but an interesting life after that. And when they built the new plant with the new bins, which were much bigger capacity. It was a pure stroke of fortune that they left more headroom than they needed to for the 15 inch wagons to, to go under, which came in later. Now, originally it was thought that the tippler was removed as soon as the um, six ton bogey hoppers came in but and i'm sorry about the quality of this picture um just to the right of the fourth column from the left you'll see a little kick in the wall on the side there and that kick is actually quite useful because we've now discovered that they, they kept the tippler at the end. So they kept all their options open throughout the whole process. So as I say, remember, remember that little bit of wall there. And in, in this shot, um, sort of bottom left, you know, forefront of the shot, you can see the kick in the wall. And that means that the, um, six tons were loaded further back than the tippler which is over to the left so it, it complicates matters but it, it explains why 
we haven't seen any pictures of the end of the gantry with the tipler gone because it all went at the same time. And the tipler is in the far distance. It's just below the signal box on the horizon. And the bank is substantial because we're way up past the engine shed and you can see one high level siding with a second one uh, towards the back, which is even higher. So you can imagine the amount of soil that they had to take out. And although this is a, a 1963 picture, um, it does sort of illustrate how they unloaded the standard gauge sleepers. We took 118 tons of sleepers, which Tom thought were in pretty poor condition. And they must have been unloading in one of the sidings because it took 10 men a week to unload 118 tons. So, so it's quite an operation. Now, we're having to apply the pictures logically because of the, um, the pictures further up with the Kerr Stewart. So we're actually starting here at the beginning of the loop for the standard gauge, and that's Raven Villa behind. And over to the right is the 15 inch gauge going in. And I'm saying these are all out of sequence because you would think that from the previous picture to this, that little bit of line would be the first to be done. But we're now talking about ratty logic. And what we actually did was we started just up at Raven Villa, um, just up from the big points, and we laid standard gauge sleepers, then put the narrow gauge track back in so that we were completely ready. We'd started in March 1929, and by May, which is Whitsun, which is the start of the tourist season, the narrow gauge track was complete. That then meant that they had time to add the standard gauge rails either side. So um, this picture, is this about where the camping coaches are now? Uh, with the engine yes. shed in the background. That's the engine shed. That's the carriage shed, which is still there. So that's Dickie's workshop. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they'd be over on that um, siding. Right, okay. But like I say, that's, that's actually jumped forward. And because we've jumped forward, we might as well go for the motive power that um, came in. We, we got the um, Kerr Stewart and it arrived in December 1929 as part of a good strain. And as it was part of a good strain, they actually removed the chains uh, linking the, uh, the axles. And we think the, the chains were in those boxes. And they're just in the process of refitting the chains. You can see right in the foreground, slightly left of center, there's a, a long black line. That's the chain for the far side between axles two and three, which we can see that they're waiting for the chain to join them up. So drivers at the front to the front axle. Then on the far side, front axle was joined uh, chained to two and then on this side two to three were joined so that that was how it drove it and we thought we'd just prove that it did have a cab cab plate at the time and they've started playing with it there were a few teething troubles um this is quite a nice shot because the um, standard gauge loop isn't complete but they get in there and in the background, one of our 
tipper waggings, um, which was used, and the extension to the engine shed, uh, which shows quite well. Uh, and this is a slightly later shot when they'd actually got into operation. And they built, they built a shed for the Coast Stewart to protect it. But anyone who lives or has visited Ravenglass frequently will know that most of the time the rain is actually coming horizontally from the left. So why they didn't protect it more, we just have no idea. So having removed the tippler, we now have a very similar view, but the siding to most weight is now continuous. This is a little excursion that's been popped in into the, the Queen's siding. So we get up to the, the point at which the standard gauge straddled the narrow gauge. These are poor prints, but they do at least demonstrate it. Uh, so that's looking back towards Raven Villa, and that's looking out towards the marsh. And as you can see, it operates just on the one standard gauge rail. Um, and that is now set, uh, you see the signal just to the right, is a, a very rudimentary signal, shall we say. And passenger tractor heading up the valley and uh, just joining the section. Uh, although this is slightly later, it still looks quite tidy, um, but it, it gives a good example of how they, they worked the system. It does confuse people who see it for the first time who think it's dual, um, dual track, um, but it isn't. And it seems that when they were returning the empties to Merswell, it, it was easier just to push them than to do any complex shunting at the other end. And the re-railing, um, I don't know what you call them, struts uh, on both sides suggest that it wasn't a rare occurrence for it just to fall off, which refers back to Tom Jones' um, comment about the sleepers. So that's again, it just pushing it up the line. And again, slightly later shot. Um, oh, sorry. <coughs> this is from 1950, um, but you can see the dual gauge again. And we're now approaching most weight. And I'm afraid my blow up isn't very good. Uh, but just ahead of the passenger tractor, you can see a, a pile of ballast. And if you look really carefully, the tree on the left, in line with the right-hand side of it, is the signal, which I tried to get a little bit closer, and it's not brilliant. But that's another shot with the rather fine lever uh, for the points. And again, it's a very rudimentary signal. And looking back, um, the pile of ballast is still there and the signal sort of fades into the background. And that's a very similar shot um, from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, nothing much has changed. So they got into the um the crushing plant and as we said the fact that they'd left extra headroom was a pure coincidence on the left hand side um, they did actually have to chip away a bit of a few bits of concrete that were protruding to get the wagons in but then when they built the extra bin on the right hand side they gave themselves a bit more clearance that uh, 15 inch gauge corner it's quite impressive, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's almost a Haywood corner, isn't yes. it? And uh, love, uh, health and safety would love the ladder to get up to the, the top of the conveyor belt. 
and on the left of the ladder is one of the small crushers uh, which was brought out and a couple of nice general shots um, this is the famous rick isles shot from 1949 and the whole system has changed um, the, the feed is on the left hand side you can see the main line going through and the row of wagons have just been emptied into the crushers which were at the bottom and then fed up a big elevator um go stuart there and an oil tank uh, which is still well we've actually found three at uh, northwaite so far we'll see them a little closer up again just a a general view of the operation. Most pictures of Mothway seem to be taken from the train. And um, bottom left is is the oil tank. Uh, there were various forms of, of tank, but as I say, we've we've discovered three. Uh, two of them are almost buried at the back of Mothway, but could be brought out and a little shot that just shows the um, chain drive quite nicely on that one and another general shot from just a little a little bit later but uh, and my favorite shot which is one of the castle ones of shunting in operation and again taken from the back of a, a moving train uh, ng41 just poking out on the left there and according to tom jones his note on this one because it, it's one of his photos his note is mclaren benz broad gauge last trip from merswaite july 1955 so that was the the swan song um, nice picture and everything when it got back down, could be moved around in the yard until it was picked up by the goods trains. Um, fair bit of coal in the front ones. <clears throat> and this is a similar shot, not quite so far back, after they dug out the bank and um, the loops there and the Coast Stewart still there and around about 1955 we have two or three pictures of it just parked up um that one was sure is 55 and we've even got a precise date for the next one which is the 10th of october 1955 um taken by george barlow and proves that the coast Stewart was still there the shop on the left is entirely new um, it had only just replaced the small booking office and in the waiting room on the right there they've still got the castellations and things from the uh, queen's coronation in 53 and um, another good dating thing. And as usual, it may have come in on a goods train, but it went out by road. And although it's not a brilliant shot, um, it is slightly sad to see it go. It's still only just fitted even then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so looking back again at Ravenglass Yard, it actually stayed very very similar through this is 1960 and although the uh, cattle dock um, fencing seems to have gone a bit black everything's still in place camping coaches have arrived and the first step was to take the fencing off but leave this great lump in the middle um, sorry i would lost the cursor there <laughs> um 
and I, I thought I'd put that in because it, it's a nice mixed good strain as well. Someone important must have been there because that looks like a Mark II Jaguar in the car park. Yes. Um, just, <clears throat> can't see what number we're on. Uh, it must be 47. I haven't got a date for that, but 63-ish. So that's classic. It couldn't have been Captain Howie when he just because I, I read somewhere <laughs> that last few years he was like he would make impromptu vis visits to Raven Das. Um, it's possible, but it's actually a bit ordinary for um, Captain Harry, I, I would have thought. Um, he, he had some fairly spectacular Hispano Suizas and Roses and things. I think a Mark II Jag is, is probably more, a bit more bank manager, isn't it? He yes. had an E-type about that time, a red one. All right. And, um, also an, an, an Austin Gypsy which he used the same French grey paint for that he painted Southern Maid around the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd we'll show you pictures at some point if you want to see them. Um, oh, is it the most behaving? Then the, the first change in the goods yard, um, everything else was still in there, but they, they took the siding away to the cattle dock. Um, I thought I had dates for these. I'm, I'm sorry I, I haven't, but this is again very early days because the Coniston Bridge has just arrived is on the right hand side. A Fiat in the car park, as yes, well. that's yes. Both, yeah, both it's not, it's not shot, but, uh, oh, the footbridge, yeah, yeah. So th that had been bought and was being, um treated and painted there before they moved it into place. So that, that's the thing that's just by the flagpole, isn't it? If yes. people are wondering what we're talking about. <laughs> yes, uh, between the camping coach and the, the new shop, um, uh, it's head on, um, which was where it got dumped. And then uh, the, the Fiat's still there, but um, they did clear it. Um, thought I had more dates than yeah, this. That, that looks like a proper heritage railway car park you know, <laughs> with, with rubble and everything in there. And as we've mentioned <clears throat> before, the sandstone edging um, was really substantial. And a week or so ago, um, we found some of it um, is, is still at most weight, and the rest is top end of Beckfoot station. Um, so that's getting better, getting more like a proper car park. And this is the final move um, of all the sidings. Um, so literally a week after the shot was taken, the line was completely disconnected. And within a fairly short time, when we get <clears throat> to this stage with the, the new booking office and shop, which it is by this point, um, you can just see the camping coaches, but there's no other clues that there was a, a standard gauge good job there. Um, I know we have to focus on that, but sad sight. And then nice new engineering workshop. So that was has as that developed. Then we thought um, we'd throw in a few visitors. Quite a few of the early ones were, were just Douglas going to the, the fence and pointing the camera. And this is an inspection coach. We have two shots of it. Um, and we'd be grateful for any information if people have them. We may put that, these ones up on the CRA website. This one equally, we believe it was on its way from Barrow to Workington to operate, but with very few details. Douglas, when he did 
um, give us details, gave us the uh, <laughs> and then we thought uh, we've had a few fun visitors on uh, on other trips. So that's Scotsman, and that's Green Arrow, uh, which was at the back of the last shot. And then again, I have almost no information on the next two or three shots. Um, it's just Douglas pointing the camera at good strains going by. Um, that, of course, is what is now phase one of the museum uh, on the right there. And another one. I can't actually offer any details on most of these. Slightly more recent one, that's Bahamas, if memory serves. Is, is that the one that keeps changing its identity? Like one week it's Bahamas, then it's Galatea, then it's Colper or whatever. Uh, that's the one that's Bahamas and he's Bahamas, but had a period as Silver Jubilee when it was coming towards the end of its ticket, I think. And then Galatea is Galatea, and that's Sierra Leone at the moment, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, I've only got this from Skim Reading magazines in Smith, so I couldn't tell you any more details about <laughs> that. <laughs> and of course, we had to throw in the, the Hogwarts Express uh, on its way past. And the reason I put that in is one of the reasons I believe that we still have the railway on the other side of the fence is the flask traffic. Um, it, over the years, it has helped our cause. So it's, it's worth adding in. Um, no idea on this one. Uh, wasn't given any information but it was a pathfinder to us. And I'm sure if Mr. Dixon's um, watching, he'll fill us in with details. Of, uh... Yeah, it's a pair of class 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll add that. No, I won't add that because I've got it already. Um, <laughs> but we're assuming it was a, a special. Um, because I think it's class 20, 301 and 302. Um, yeah, so. if, you've got, if you've got dates, there's, there's a good rail tour website that will tell you exact details of where it came from. But um, without dates, it's more difficult. Yeah. Um, I, I seem to be short on dates on this one. I think what I'm reading from is the early version of the notes. Um, and as usual, I can only apologize. It is Pathfinder, because uh, there's a, a little sign above the buffer. Um, this is the Burma Star and A another. Um, another charter. North by Northwest. Mm. And now we need Christopher to jump in with a few more details of this because they're a sequence of his. Um... Uh, year, two, year 2015. On the left is the um, Three Beaks by a rail heading north. All oh, no. oh, right. Right is one of the loco hauled class 37 that was running at that time. Uh, right. Yeah, so that, that's just the standard um, one going southbound. Yeah. Yeah, that was the period where it was top and tail. They were top and tail before the DBSOs arrived. Yeah. So, yeah, it would have been 2015. So, a few sort of interesting changes. The, the platforms have been raised and we've got lamps, uh, but we haven't got. Oh, no, I have to be careful here. Well, I was going to say, we haven't got CCTV. So, a uh, guerrilla painting of the outside of the museum between trains, we were able to do. 
I'm going to have to edit that out with your <laughs> now because we can't we can't have you publicly saying that. Then. <laughs> Looks like the class fifty seven hasn't got any tail lights on either. It's a bit naughty. It's got a round tail lamp. No, no, it's got built in tail lights. What you use that? I would guess it was shut down, so it wouldn't have had power. Maybe. I suppose we're in between flashes on the tail light as well. <laughs> were, were you on that Three Peaks train, Sam? Yeah, I would have been, yeah. That's brilliant. I, I, they generally, they ran, yeah, with the back loco shut down, so that'll be why there was a tail light on there. Hmm. That's good. We we like to gather information. Um, oh, that's that's better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't entirely live in the nineteen twenties. <laughs> Just most of the time. Well, everyone needs a Hoover now and again, Dave. <laughs> uh, then this is just a, a trip up the line. Um, at and it's just I've definitely stones. got the it is yes uh, i'm not sure how they came to know about it but uh, it looks a bit grim on this side but when you see the other side i just hope there wasn't anyone in that uh, chalet at the time it would have been a rude awakening and I, I put this in especially for the track gang. If you look on the right hand side there, they're uh, just lifting another rail into Is it a rail into place? There's, there's plenty of them anyway. And they haven't got the flash lifters that our track gang have. So we, we just jump back briefly to uh, the Coast Stewart and its life after the Ratty. And well, I mean, the captions there, so it's 1962, um, but it's the only picture I've seen of the Coast Stewart at the colliery. Um, all the other ones we have seem to be at Rum River, um, at Litchfield. Then we thought we'd do the return because uh, it came back in 2000, in May 2000, for a, uh, a little celebration for. Ratty one two five, and Mr. Teb actually caught them unloading it, and I believe he jumped on and rode on it for that long journey from where it is now to there. Um, but it it was it was really nice to to see it back. Do we know if he was in the cab or was he just lifting his feet off the ground? I think he was in the cab. Right, okay. Details, Dave, details. <laughs> <laughs> and a view from the other side. Uh, we seem to have rattled through these, but um, this is, we think, at Foxfield in 2005. Um, and the one that I thought was at Rum River, I'm told is actually at Foxfield because it's after they modified the cab windows. Um, modified is, is actually, I think, too strong a word. Uh, well, I can think of stronger ones. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's more polite than what I was thinking. Well, why have they armoured the sides as well? <laughs> have you been to Foxfield, Matthew? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, another general manager and uh, John McCullough. Um, nice memory. So then, thanks to Phil Brown, we've actually got the start of the extension through to Barrow on the dual gauge. Um, if you look on the southbound line, um, it is very reminiscent. And we also have a very rare picture indeed of um, a DeLorean train and it was just accelerating away. That's our story anyway. <clears throat> As I have raced through them, 
I did put in Doak's um, oil train, the Marshon oil train derailment. So we might as well do those while we're here. Oh, before we do, <laughs> I am working on the old notes. Um, Dave Mosley um, very kindly transcribed quite a lot of Tom Jones' diaries. And I'm sure he thought at the time that it was a bit of an irrelevance and probably wasn't worth doing. But I can give a, a summary now of how everything developed on the standard gauge. And then on one of the pages, we found this. And because it's very hard to read, I'll use the transcription. And we potentially could have been running on three gauges at once because they were talking about connecting the quarry down to the crushing plant at Merthwaite. And by the look of this, they were actually planning a three foot side by side with the 15 inch. So I think three foot straddle in the 15 inch would have been a bit of a, a problem. But they, they looked at it quite seriously, um, including uh, a 90 HP diesel loco, uh, three foot, which at the time was priced at 1400 pounds. So it's, it's still a lot of money, but wouldn't that have been something to see? Running on three gauges. It, it gets slightly more bonkers. It, really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we keep saying that for a small line tucked away in a valley in the left hand side of the Lake District, so well away from some people would say civilization, um, we had a curious mix of make do and mend and some inspired um, reimagining of Ella into ICL2 and River Mike 1, um, you know, very much on the cheap. And then we have cutting edge stuff because some of the plant at Merthwaite was really cutting edge. And we've had um, mining engineers who've come into the museum and said, you know, we didn't know there was a 48 inch vertical uh, crusher and we've only got the plate and this guy was going off to research it. Uh, we haven't heard back from him. But in, in essence, the answer to that is the Liverpool connection because with a firm like Cunard and the connections that Sir Aubrey had, there was, he was across what was going on, what was about to go on. And we think that was the, the reason behind the, um, the cutting edge stuff. But, you know, then they build River Might. So it's a complete contrast. It's interesting as well, because uh, someone might correct me, but I mean, I know we're talking old horsepowers and when they were proper horsepowers, <laughs> But some of our locals today on 15 inch gauge aren't that far away from that horsepower rating. Right. Which is quite, you don't realize how big our stuff is now yes. compared to yeah. vintage stuff. I could be wrong there, and Christopher may correct me, but <laughs> it's, just, well, no, it's, it's quite eye opening when you see these sort of figures quoted. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, Tom didn't date lots of his um, notes uh, so we don't have a date for this but it, it does seem to be around the same time that we got the Coast Stewart and again we were ahead of the game mm -hmm. in, in getting a standard gauge diesel. That's essentially um, our foray into standard gauge. We'll, we'll have a look at the comments and see if there's anything uh, yes, the standard gauge uh, was only 90. 
the thing um, we should remind people of as well, because this we were talking about earlier this week, the museum here's collection policy, although it's very focused on the Raven Glass Nesto Railway, we do actually collect all railways and industry in the, the locality of the railway. So although the standard gauge stuff might seem irrelevant, it's actually quite important in our collecting here. Um, if it all gets a little dull at times with lots of units and things like that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, you're right. Rerailing frogs is exactly what I should have written down. <laughs> And um, the Glencoe Glen Folk Museum is recommending we talk to Mike Powell for big railway information in the 1960s. Yes, um, we do have some of his photos and I was looking to put them on this collection, but they're not all local. Um, I couldn't actually find mm. any really local ones. And Robert confirmed Bahamas is Bahamas. <laughs> and Christopher confirmed that uh, Galatea is the one with the identity crisis. <laughs> and apparently it's out of ticket as well. And it was a Dell tick, that one that looks like a class 37. Ah, uh, right. That, um, which was Royal Highland Fusilier. Yeah, it was, on a, it was on a tour that ran from down south to uh, Workington. Uh, I got on it at Preston, that's how I remember it. I can't remember right. where it started. It went through to Workington. All right. That, that's brilliant because some of the some of our information is is scant at the best of times. Can you remember the year, Robert? Uh probably about 2000. I'm not sure, but uh, right. I think it'd be about then. Excellent. And Jacob has put 1st of June 1996 for the 20 tour. Right. <laughs> and um, one of Glencoe Folk Museum's friends had a, a Lima Burma star, and it's a true story. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's probably worth a bit now. I don't think you get Lima anymore. And Will Tilson, um, 8th of February 1997 for your North by Northwest tour. Oh, brilliant. With the class 33. Hang on. Hey. So Dave, Dave is frantically writing all this information down. I don't know why I do this, because I end up making more work for myself. And Glencoe Folk Museum, we have to be one of the only UK railways to work commercially with three different gauges, right? We think so, yes. I would guess so. Romney did ten and a oh, Romney did three, but not commercially, because they had ten and a quarter at one point. And then they had the standard gauge with Dunrobin. Yes. Oh, yeah. So In the original Romney railway was standard gauge that across the level crossing. That was yes. everything was delivered, of course. <laughs> and during the war, they got the war. fifteen inch inside the standard gauge to uh, unload the Pluto pipes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so we're about even then. We're yeah, yeah. 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 It's cool. Yeah, yeah, I just started thinking. The Fairborns <laughs> top trumpeters as well. <laughs> 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 Um, oh, you said commercial. I think I was probably lost more money than it ever made. Um, <laughs> Christopher he thinks that the Kerr Stewart um, was yes. only 90 horsepower. Yes, it was. Because yeah. um, am I right in thinking that was the Welsh Highland one that they're restoring? Is not that far in date or from ours it was, in that process. It was literally period. months yeah. months ahead of us. Um, yeah. <laughs> we could probably do alignment i'm sure trevor's got alignment drift stories as well yeah keeps me awake at night 
Well, one thing to remember while we're talking about working um, with, with the standard gauge and the 15-inch gauge and locomotives, of course, is that we did occasionally bring wagons down with the with the Muehl tractors. And one other little bit of snippet, which probably a lot of people know, is the damage to the concrete bridge abutments at KT Caddy was a standard gauge derailment as well. On the left hand side coming down the bridge abutments are, are damaged all right yeah the, the, you remember this there's a the, the the race bridge has got the concrete bridge abutments there's another one shy of might side loop and then there's one at katie caddy on the curve there and the one at katie caddy's damaged and it right. was allegedly by a, a standard gauge derailment <laughs> yeah, apparently, um, one thing, again, I only picked up from uh, Tom's notes was uh, there was quite a bit of realignment, um, some bits at the mill, and then a substantial slew across at Katie Caddy, because uh, that, that got a mention. Um, so, you know, not only were they sort of clearing a pass, putting the standard gate sleepers down, getting the 15 inch up and running, and then the standard gauge, but they were actually digging and moving around as well. And we- yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know the David's on tonight, but if you look at our track bed from the Dale Garth end of Mike Side Loop going up, to the little bridge at Katie Caddy and into wet cutting, there's a tremendous amount of ballast in there. It, you, it, you can dig in to the shoulders quite a way, and there's a lot of lot of ballast been put in there to build that up to mm. get the you know to get in excess of four foot eight and a half, the sleepers etc. And, and a shoulder, you know the classic the classic postcards we see of the the train coming down into the fifteen inch gauge train coming down the line uh, from Dale Garth on the sweep of the curve with the, the standard gauge and the 15 inch interlaced. Um, and that, that's a, there's a hell of a lot of ballast in there. I don't know why I didn't put that in because uh, it's one of the Sankeys. It's a really nice picture as well. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll um, add it in next time. <laughs> yeah. And Trevor, you were saying the other week that because um, people who go on the modern ratty always go under Mulcaster Mill Bridge going, how did they get standard gauge through? And you were saying you you think that it was more or less the same level we work on today, weren't you? Is, or did I misunderstand that? No, no, I, I think unless anybody else has got another view, I, I think that, that, you know, that if you, if you lift our track out, there's not much underneath there other than Pinnell. There's, it's very hard... I think it's kind of that's where it is that the, that's what they've had to work with, and if you look at our formation now coming between Blackbridge and the Road Bridge, it drops away slightly, but it doesn't give you the impression that they've had to dig way down to get some depth to get under the bridge, and likewise, it's always fallen away on the Delgarth side of the bridge towards the the halt at Mike side at uh, Mongaster Mill. So I think it's kind of that's what you're stuck with, sort of thing. Mm. We we've got another photo that I didn't put in because I, I didn't want to copy too many out of the the magazine, um, and it's one that uh, we don't have the original from. Um, actually, shows the Kirstier under Mongaster Mill Bridge, and there's very little daylight between them. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that's another, maybe I should have put the degraded one in. Um, have you heard David, of that? David, David Collins was asking, was there ever a steam um, standard gauge up to most way? Not, not as far as well, we're aware. And I think linking into Trevor's levels um, information, you'd have a job to get a standard gauge. It'd have to be a very small standard gauge steam engine yes. to get under the bridge yes you'd be into um cornish port mm. of par size <laughs> engines really 
That'd be fun. Either that or no camp. Is there any evidence in photos of a um, standard gauge van going up the line, or are only the Kerr Stewart cab and the and um, relatively low wagons? Um, there's certainly no photos of of any form of van. Um, yeah, we. I, I just can't think of any photos. So as far as I'm aware, it was just ballast wagons and the Kerr Stewart. Um, and someone's asking so, about the accident. Yes, um, Matthew is. I, I really need to collar Peter and get the full details. He does have a photo of the loco that went into the sidings and it did indeed end up on the village road. Um, I, I really should try and squeeze some more information out of, of Peter. So I, that, I do have a list of questions for Peter, <laughs> um, so we can add it to that list. So is that implying that a standard gauge loco ended up in the main road into Ravenglass? Yes. Gosh. That would have taken some sweeping up, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's in his, um, his paperback on the history of Ravenglass Village. I think, what I can remember, it was like 1860s, like just after the line was taken over by the Furnace Railway. It was one of Furnace Railway number 20's 060 cousins that ended up in the uh, valley, in the village road. Yes, that, that, that sounds right, Matthew. Um, uh, I wonder if he has got any more information. Certainly, certainly he's shown on one of his presentations, he, he did show a photo of the loco and, and told the story. Um, I haven't transcribed that because I haven't actually been on, a, on YouTube, um, mainly out of embarrassment. <laughs> right. Is that it? I found a picture. I found a picture outside Captain Howie's house at Red Tiles, and there's a jag that looks very similar to that one somebody was asking about in the background. Do you, want, do you want me to let you share it, Andy? I'll try. I'll try. Uh, multiple part. So that should you should be able to share now, Andy. Okay. Right. I've now right. So share screen. Is that the jag? GCR twelve. Yeah. Well, it could be. That's Captain Howie with his new jag. Well, he's 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you could be right. I don't yeah. know. Go back. You, I don't right, know. If, I, if, I, if I stop share now, you could perhaps dig that other picture out and we can swap between the two. Well, we'll, we'll try next time. If you now. haven't shut it all down. Just bear with us. GCR 12, I think that number plate was. <clears throat> GCR 12. We may not be able to zoom in in that detail, but we'll have a go. Check the headlights. It's all pretty distinctive. So I've got an AA badge on the front. Ooh, right, so we're going back the way. Da, 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 da. Oh, there, it, there it is. Uh, oh, yeah. back a bit. Back a up. Next one. Next one. There you there are. are. We might have to get Dave to have a look at the original at some point. Yes. Yeah. I think it looks more, it's a very similar model, isn't it? Mm. Uh, I don't think that's a Jag. No. Which car were you looking at? The one straight to the. I've just moved my cursor across the screen to point at it. The, <laughs> the, 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 one, the one that's by the good shed. Not the Morris Minor hut peeping no, around the no. corner. No, it's I don't think that's a jag. No. No, no. All right. I'll, I'll, now that I know which one it is, um, what I'll, you have to do is open up the original photo and then enlarge it, I guess. Yes, yeah. Oh, thanks. That's uh, more work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've just zoomed in on our picture and it's got an AA badge on the front. Oh, something or other. Two spots, two fogs. Yeah. An AA badge and an A another badge. Mm. But, uh, 
Incidentally, this one of the pictures that Tony Crowhurst had. So I don't know where he would have got it from because it's too early for him to have been old enough really to take many pictures. Oh, right. So, well, look got right. It look nice and sharp. Yeah, there's loads of pictures from that era all around red tiles and stuff. Mm. It could be um, Colin, could be Colin Gilbert. Ah, yes. can't remember what he was driving at the time. Looks more like a Daimler to me, personally. But uh, yeah, that could be it, Simon. It could be Colin Gilbert. Mm. David Collins was asking how long might it have taken him to drive up there, knowing how he not much longer than it would take you now, probably quicker. It'd <laughs> be less well, traffic then. Yeah. He's just knock him off the road anyway. The story just, is that just um, a thought. Sorry, just a thought on guessing who he might belong to. Could it have been or have been Sir Wakefield back then? Um, yes, because I I've no idea uh, what vehicles he was driving at the time. Um, there's, when, there's when did he issue. start becoming like personally involved, rather than just like in the background kind of? Well, he, he was actually there in 1960. Um, he, he wasn't as far in the background um, as has been suggested. Uh, he, he was very pro and very positive uh, at that time. Um, so yeah, we can we can certainly check that out. Uh, that's another whole research project. If any of our volunteers wants to uh, volunteer, <laughs> but um, Ma Matthew it was correct, wasn't he, Andy? That how he did used to come tearing up. To, to Ravenglass and sit on the wall. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He'd, he'd just go wherever he felt like. I mean, he, you know the story about him wanting to put a wanted Jaguar to put a fifth cylinder on one of his Jags. They said, no, it can't be done. Can't be done. So he got his engineers to put a fifth cylinder on, put a glass bonnet on the, on the car, and then drove it up to Jags and said, yes, it can be done. <laughs> just, <laughs> so it's up there. No, he did go wherever he liked. I think he felt he had the right to go anywhere. What was it? We were, we were, uh, when we were uh, sitting between showers today, uh, Steve Rogers, our uh, S&T manager, was saying his brother was pulled out of the road by a, a neighbour because how he came hurtling round the bend doing sort of a handbrake turn or something <laughs> yeah. and uh, nearly took his brother out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and uh, Mike, Mike Decker in 1968 drove from Raymond Glass to Romney inside a day. So, yeah, oh. well, to, to be fair to Captain Harry, the story we have from 1925 was that something broke on Goddess and they set off late afternoon from Raven Glass, went to Romney and got back for lunch the next day. Oh, with, yeah. Apart. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been Romney in 25, it would have been Paxman's Pat Colchester. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. oh, that, that's a bit shorter. Yeah. <laughs> Probably <laughs> Robert's a lot. Lot. <laughs> um, and, and Robert's given us the date of 17th of June 2000 for the Deltic tour. And by the way, with I don't know if you've heard with uh, all the problems in Dover, both the M20, M2, and A20 are all chock a block at the moment with lorries. Yes. Don't try and come down to Kent by road. By road. <laughs> Any particular reason, or was it still best? to do with the P and O? P and O cross channel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's something like twice the normal number of lorries try to get down to Dover today than would normally go to eight thousand so, instead of four thousand. Jun junction uh, eight to eleven M twenty is solid eastbound. It's about lorry thirty lorry. miles. Let, let's hope it's cleared up before you gather in May. Yeah, yeah. Set off now. <laughs> <laughs> well, as ever, um, thank you all for participating this evening. Uh,